Uh, welcome back. Uh, let's see here. Uh, it is a long quiz day, which explains why the room is half full. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, announcements for the course, hopefully you guys saw uh, this morning um, where MIT has, has managed to like triple schedule my schedule without asking me. Uh, so unfortunately, I can't make my own office hours on, on Wednesday morning. So I moved them to Thursday morning and, 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 and granted just a 24 hour extension on the, the homework. So uh, hopefully this <coughs> will make your Halloween somewhat more relaxing anyway. Uh, and uh, yeah, so after this, there's like what? How many more homeworks? Just one, right? Yeah, so there's one more homework. Start thinking about your project proposals if you haven't already. And there's a, a midterm coming up. Those, I think, are the main uh, uh, to do so far in class. Uh, do you have any, any procedural questions before we get started for the day? Okay, so uh, today we're going to do a topic that I would love to cover for an entire course, but instead I'm allotted about 90 minutes of, 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 of one lecture to uh, cover, uh, which is an interesting challenge. And every year uh, I try a slightly different set of, of pictures and diagrams and arm waving and, and singing and dancing to communicate these ideas. and. and, and we haven't always succeeded yet, but I'm going to try again because every year I refuse as a mathematician to give up this topic for at least one lecture in a graphics class. Um, and so that's our, our job today, uh, is to communicate to you guys the basic ideas of, in sampling, aliasing, and, and bitmaps. Um, essentially, in, in the old versions of this at, at MIT, there was just like a weird like, diagonal lines are hard to draw kind of thing, and I thought that was boring. So we're all grown ups here. We can try and do a little bit of math. But not too much math because because we only give a lecture. Okay. Uh, so so that's your warning. So today is a little bit experimental. Uh, if at any point you are lost or confused, stop me and I'll try to clarify. Cool. Cool. Okay. So here's the big issue uh, that we're going to try and tackle today, um, which is this uh, this rendered image that, that we see here. Right. So here is is one of our favorite ray traced scenes. It involves four balls and a checkerboard floor. I think you guys are all sick and tired of scenes that look like that if you started your own work. Uh, but the reality is that the, the, the history of, of rendering looked an awful lot like this for many years. Uh, but of course, this isn't a particularly visually attractive image. And beyond the sort of surreal Lambertian ball thing going on, uh, I would say that probably the least attractive part of this is the fact that we have these artifacts that go right around the corner of these, these shapes. And, and these are, are well-known artifacts. Uh, computer scientists are, or computer graphics people, I'll call them jaggies, right? Because they look jagged. Uh, and, 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 and that's essentially an issue that we've ignored so far in our ray tracing pipeline, right? So those of you guys who have done your homework probably generated a lot of really ugly images that look a lot like these. Yeah? And of course, heuristically, solving this problem is really simple, right? What do you do? You just set a bunch more rays through the pixel kind of average. Um, but the question that, that, that we're going to try to answer today is, is that the end of the story? Like, do you, for example, do I think of my pixel like a little square sitting in space and uniformly average? Well, it's not so clear, right? Because then there's a discontinuity between two adjacent pixels that could still have made some, some kind of sharp artifact there that might not be so desirable, right? And these issues come up over and over and over again in different discussions, right? So uh, the one that's most obvious is in sampling. Uh, another is in um, uh, magnification. And, and minification, right? So in, in particular, if you have a large texture and a small object, right? we talked about this before, then what can happen is that between two adjacent pixels on your rendering of the small object, uh, they land in two very far away places of the texture. And just because of noise in the texture, you, you, you'll, you'll, you'll get basically just random numbers over here. Remember, we talked about this before. Um, or it also shows up in, in rasterization, which we haven't talked about yet, but we will. I think starting next week. Remember, rasterization is like, like so far the ray tracing pipeline we talked about is sort of the physics inspired version of rendering where I'm tracing around light. And rasterization is like the painting inspired one where I'm going to go one object at a time and paint it. Yeah. Uh, and of course, if we try to rasterize a diagonal line, if it's not vertical or horizontal, right, the reality is we'd like to capture this nice light blue thing, but all we can render are these like weird jagged dark blue pieces. Or in case I haven't convinced you that this problem is important yet, yet another place it shows up uh, is in moray patterns. So here uh, I took a photo of a brick wall, uh, and, and, and you can see what happened, which is uh, there's actually a low frequency, if you look closely. Actually, maybe I'll dip the lights for today's lecture because there's a lot of things we're going to have to look closely at. Um, 
If you look closely at, at, at the, the, the thick billing here, um, you see a visual artifact that really shouldn't be there, right? There, there's this low frequency set of fans that moves all along the, uh, the bricks. And, and like we'll, what we'll see in just a few minutes is essentially what this has to do with is the relative spacing between the, bit, the, the bricks relative to the spacing between uh, the pixels, right? And because these are sampled at different rates, uh, you can see interesting, weird, low-frequency artifacts that aren't really there. Sometimes we call these ghosts. Yeah? Or if you don't like that example, here's yet another one, uh, which I think we all know and love. This is called the wagon wheel cut. If YouTube is going to be agreeable. Uh, uh, man, come on. Ah, there. So I think this is a car ad. Right. And I think we've all seen car advertisements that look like this, right? Where the car is zooming forward and suddenly. Wheels look stationary, or even like they're going backward. Do you guys know what's going on here? Exactly. So let's say that the, my camera takes one frame once, like 30 times a second. Yeah, and in one thirtieth of a second, my car wheel goes 179 degrees. Right, or, or rather, I guess 359 degrees. Yeah. Well then, then what happens? Well, then effectively it kind of looks like you know my wheel started this way and ended up moving backward, right? And this is yet another case where so there's one periodic motion happening, which is the motion of your wheel. There's another periodic thing happening, which is the sampling of the camera frames. And because those two things don't align, actually the really crazy thing that happens is that you actually get low frequency artifacts that show up because you have too much high frequency. So hopefully I'll convince you guys that, uh, <laughs> that, uh, 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 that aliasing is, is really a critical problem, whether it's in the temporal domain or in space. Okay. Uh, don't laugh. You guys will see, too. Okay. So uh, uh, what's broken? Well, in a sense, um, you know, we live in, in, in vaguely a, a, a real value world, uh, and we're on a discrete value computer system. Right? And I mean that in a lot of different ways. Right? We have a pixel grid. Every pixel has a finite number of colors it can store, right? having to do with the number of bits you use to store your image. And when you sort of look right at the intersection of those two things, this is where these artifacts start to come up. Right? Like with our car wheel spinning, of course, if we had an infinite number of video frames, we wouldn't see that, that artifact. Right? And this is true. I encourage you guys the next time you're driving on the highway to lean out the side of your car and, and, and take a look at the neighboring car wheel. Please don't do this. And what you'll see is that the wheel looks like it's moving forward. <laughs> it does, you, these, are, these are just sampling <laughs> artifacts. It, it's not like it's a, if you get too close, it'll look like something else. Um, uh, but uh, you know, these are just issues with the fact that we're trying to discretize. And, and we did it in kind of a natural way. Yeah? Or, uh, I mean, another way to put it is if I put a pixel grid on top of this very complicated scene here, and I'm allowed one value per square here, what do I choose? And I'd say the answer is unclear. <laughs> yeah? And in fact, that's more or less the takeaway from today's lecture, is that there's no right answer here. Um, that this is an unnatural problem, and it has to do with our hardware, rather than <coughs> any, like God-given, you know, correct thing to do to represent a color inside of a pixel. That said, there are plenty of theoretical models that try to explain what's going on here. Uh, and that's what we're going to explore today, is how do people think about the sampling problem uh, and, and, and try to resolve it in a reasonable fashion. Yeah? And so in general, uh, the high-level strategy here is to employ both mathematical and perceptual tricks to compensate for sampling. Right? And sampling problems are called aliasing. Anybody know where this term comes from? Like an alias is like a ghost. Right? And it's like weird, this is good, you know, it's Halloween. Uh, it's, it's, you know, we saw this weird ghost low frequency artifact uh, in, your, in your image uh, that, that shouldn't have been there, right? Uh, and that's roughly what ends up happening when you undersample stuff. We'll see. Um, and, and, and notice that, that I've used the phrase mathematical and perceptual. There are going to be two ways out of this, right? One is to understand the mathematics of sampling and maybe better understand, for example, how dense does my pixel grid need to be to capture a shape of a particular size. Um, and the other hand, I know also things like how far apart are the sides <coughs> of your eye, and can I leverage that in a way so that, yeah, maybe there's this aliasing, but you just can't see it because because your eyes are lame, and, and that's, that's light. Right? Uh, and, and the reality is that, that we sit right halfway in between these two lines. Okay? 
there are all kinds of fun examples. Uh, so for example, uh, here's, here's a fruit bowl. Um, and, and here, uh, what we, we, we've done is, is explicitly illustrate sort of what your ray tracer is doing. You see this? So the ray tracer would like shoot a ray through each of these little uh, yellow dots here. Right? And when you read off these colors, you get an ugly thing. Now the reality is that this might actually be an okay image. Right? Like if that really is like what, a 10 by 10 grid of pixels? And these days we talk about like megapixel photographs, then it might be that when I stare at it from this distance, that's fine. You know? um, but the, what we don't want is for the, this, this weird artifact that we see here is somehow noticeable in a bad uh, fashion. Yeah? And so uh, you know, a similar thing happens when we see these jagged boundaries. It just has to do with this itty bitty distance of whether or not you're above that white dot, which really shouldn't affect the color of the pixel in a global kind of binary way. Actually, uh, there are really fun examples in Google. You can like see all kinds of crazy examples people have constructed of just data and they say, uh, here's a purposefully badly constructed one, right? So we've got like weird teeth alien thing going with teeth going in every which direction. And, 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 and look what's happened here. So for instance, these triangles, every other one just barely intersects the white pixel. And so you see, you know, this guy is it's like kind of a bug tooth alien because uh, it's missing these, these two guys relative to the other. And, and if you play with your assignment, uh, you, you, can, you can record this too. So for instance, this is a very typical looking image, right, where you, you, the texture looks okay close to the camera, but as it goes to the background of the scene, it suddenly becomes undersampled, right, because the checkerboards get smaller, uh, and, and that's where you run into trouble. And the really frustrating part is, of course, that rather than just seeing noise, which your eye actually is really good at ignoring, you, what you see is a coherent, non-physical <coughs> Right? This is the worst possible thing for graphics. Right? Instead of just seeing like random numbers, what you see for some reason is some hyperbolic thing when you take a photo of this building. Okay. So, you know, without boxing too poetic, roughly, I, I think what I would say is that, that graphics really is about uh, translating this movie, you know, continuous problems to discrete one, and, and that interface is one that we haven't thought about very carefully. So from that perspective, um, if we want to continue to ask uh, high-level, useless philosophical questions, I think the most reasonable one to ask is, well, what is a pixel? And I think the important thing to notice is that in, in, in most uh, uh, models of computer graphics, and when I say models of computer graphics, I really mean theoreticians that try to understand graphics algorithms. These are people that exist. Um, you have to decide what a pixel is. And typically, it's not a disk or a tiny light. The reality is that your laptop screen and your iPhone, and your projector, and your clock on the back of the wall, all <coughs> send light out in very different fashion. Right? So if you try to model that physical process, you're very unlikely to succeed unless you really, really care about that last mile of getting your display just right for a particular uh, electronic device. So instead, typically what we do is think about a pixel as a sample from, from the real world. And this aligns with, with what we've done in ray tracing, right? Because you, know, you can think of that pixel value as just the color you got, and you set that one ray up. It doesn't tell you anything about if I perturb that ray by a millimeter, what color I get. Right? So there's no notion of like taking an integral over a box. We haven't done that in the box. We've just been taking samples. And that's going to be the kind of theory that, that we're going to try and carry out soon. Okay? So first, let's, let's introduce two uh, vocabulary words in case you haven't seen them before. Uh, one of them is sampling. And this is taking a continuous function and, and mapping it to a discrete one. So for instance, you know, maybe I have some function like this, uh, and of course in reality, uh, all I get is some vector of numbers, which maybe are the values of my function on the integer grid, right? And then effectively what I've done is I have sampled this function. Sampled. Um, right, and so it has to do kind of with the horizontal axis here. Yeah. Um, and in, in, in a sense, I think we can all agree that, that in, in, in some sense what, what Red Wing is trying to do is sample from the real world. If we only have a budget of this many pixels, we can't display some pixel information. No. On the other hand, there's a second source of error, uh, which has to do with the vertical axis. Right? So at every one of these samples, I compute a color, right, an RGB value. And that RGB value is maybe represented with 32, 64, 128 bits which means that there's two to that number different colors that that pixel really can take on. This is a different kind of artifact called quantization, right, which is taking a variable and mapping it to a discrete one. Right, so this is like saying that I can't have all possible colors, I can just have these two colors. Right? 
right? And, and, and so in reality, they round that color up and down a little bit. So in graphics, uh, we typically ignore quantization when we talk about the theory stuff and mostly focus on sampling. And the reason is that the space between pixels is a lot bigger than the space between colors, perceptually. That like your displays are capable of making really, really fine gradations in color. So it's kind of okay to think of that like a real number, like something smooth. But there's always space between pixels, and the world is really detailed. So that uh, that sampling side uh, is quite a bit. Does that make sense? <coughs> so if, if you if you need like a nice picture and mnemonic to remember this kind of stuff, here's one one way to think about it. Right? Sampling is like the horizontal axis about trying to approximate the smooth function of x, and quantization is like discretizing the vertical. So the basic model of, of like what is computer graphics is a weird question to ask. But if you're a theorist, one way you might view it is that it's really just sampling and, and reconstruction. Right? And the idea is that well, I don't actually like continuous here, but I'd say visual uh, uh, visual light is, is a function that depends on continuous set of positions in space. Right? For every x y position in front of me, I can shoot out a ray and get a color map. I'll probably argue that the color itself might be discontinuous, right? Not sharp edges. That aside, there's a lot of colors out there, and, and, and they come into my eye from all different places. Yeah. So what do I do? Whether it's with a digital camera or a ray tracer, I first sample this thing, meaning that rather than getting the full continuum of light that's in front of my eye, in reality, what, I, what do I get? I like place a little postage stamp in front of my face. I send a ray through a bunch of, of little, uh, you know, array indices, and I get one color for each one, and that is my sample signal. Yeah, so for instance, on the digital camera, this corresponds to the filter that's sitting in front of your sensor. And this goes from an infinite amount of information to five. Okay? So then, uh, what do I do? Well then, I try to reconstruct this signal. And this is, I think, a term that, that maybe gets thrown around and is unclear. But here, what do I mean by reconstruct? I mean, I take a photo of, of all of your faces in this classroom, and then, you know, when I'm being creepy and sitting by myself at home. I load up that photo and I look at it, realizing this is a weird example now. And, uh, and, and what am I doing? I am recreating my experience in the classroom. Do you see that? that like essentially, in, in an ideal display, right? what is that display trying to do? It's trying to send the rays into my eye as if I were standing right here. Right? So I sampled my signal, I took a photo, right? and I collected a finite set of, of pixel values. And then later on, when I display that photo on my screen, effectively I was reconstructing. Right? I was trying to recreate that experience of receiving light into my eye. Okay. And, and, and both of these steps can create uh, uh, problems that we'll see. Uh, uh, that both uh, having a bad reconstruction or having a bad sampling tool, both are, are, are good ways to create error. Yeah? And essentially, the best way to solve a sampling problem, this is kind of like what we talk about in ray tracing, is just take more samples. Right? Uh, because when you have infinitely, uh, when you have insufficient sampling, what ends up happening is that high frequencies look like low frequencies. And this phenomenon is, is called the alias. Yeah? And, and so here is the sort of classic example where what I've done is I've taken a high frequency sine wave, right? It wiggles up and down quite a bit. And then I've taken a bunch of samples at some lower frequencies, and that's what these, the, the red dots are. And take a look, they trace out their own problem. This is something you guys can try at home. If you just take sine of AX and you sample it at some kind of far apart set of samples, you'll see that they're actually consistent with some lower frequency set of, of, of things. This is like something that's not worth checking in class, but, but you hopefully you can see in this picture as well. Okay. So how do we solve this in practice? Well, there's sort of two uh, uh, primary things that we want to do. <coughs> One is, is oversample, meaning, well, clearly we didn't take enough samples to resolve that crazy high frequency stuff, so we should take more, right? Uh, and the other is to blur this data out. In other words, to say, like, well, what I'm gonna do is say, I can't, I can't sample from this image, there's too much detail here, so instead I'm gonna put a big blurring filter in front of my camera that just smears everything out, and now I can't sample from it. And, and that's gonna correspond roughly uh, to, to the mathematical, mathematical roots that we have. Um, so, for instance, on um, the, the poor man's anti-aliasing algorithm, which I use often because much, most of my research is in MATLAB because I'm lazy, uh, is render it at 10 times the resolution I need and then I shrink the image. Uh, and that would be an example of oversampling. 
not a smart thing to do. Which I think, but, yeah. uh, but in order to, to actually understand what's, what's really happening here, we actually need a little bit of math. And that's what we're going to try and do now. Every year I try and do this, and every year it fails. So get excited. Okay? Uh, and so this is going to be the opposite of, of rigorous math. We're going to just draw lots of pictures and try to understand Fourier transform by looking at wiggly stuff and taking down problems. Okay? That's, that's our, our plan for today, uh, because unfortunately in our next lecture we're going to go on to rasterization. Yeah? But I think it's actually worth thinking about this stuff, because it just gives you some taste of how people go about thinking about sampling, um, and, and, and there's some, some good lessons to be learned here. Okay? So uh, here's going to be our model is that we're going to talk about one-dimensional <coughs> signals. Right? You can think about a, a, an image or a photograph as a two-dimensional signal, meaning it takes a position in x and y, and it outputs a color. Instead, we're just going to like look at one slice through our image, so just like you know, one set of, of, of the horizontal line where it comes. Okay? And the green uh, plot here is the function we're trying to sample. So maybe this is the distribution of light coming into my eye as I like do the you know, sprinkler thing and, and look all around. So everybody cool with the setup so far? So x is position, y and f of x are, are, are like a chess move. Okay? So first I have to ask a question of what does it mean to, to sample a function? Right? So I, I'm given some, some function like this, uh, then if I sample it, what am I doing? Well, I'm going to take sort of a regularly spaced set of points on the x-axis here, and essentially I'm going to throw away all the information in between those, those regularly spaced points. Okay? And so there's a, a theoretical model for this that they call multiplied by an impulse train. Incidentally, this is like a good band name if you're looking for like cute MIT a cappella titles. I would like always look for this on the, on the walls. Um, essentially, the idea is that I'm going to take a function which is like 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, right? And if I take the product of these two things, then effectively I've taken this green guy and just zeroed him out in between the ones. The reality is, if you guys are a math student, it's not a 1 at, the, at these arrows. I've drawn them like arrows. That's because they're actually Dirac delta functions. This is for kind of technical uh, reasons. But, but, but I think the concept is the same, that roughly all you're doing is, is just throwing away information in between them and the points. Okay? So in the reality, rather than having this green curve, when I go to reconstruct my signal, what do I have? I have this. And that's really the input to the reconstruction problem, right? There's like two people working together, right? We've got Larry and Sophie, and Larry can collect numbers, and then he hands them to Sophie, and she tries to reconstruct. But she doesn't know what happened in between the numbers that Larry collected, right? For example, she doesn't know <coughs> that there's this crazy wiggle that happened between these two records. Yeah? So what would Sophie do, being the reasonable TA that she is? Uh, you know, she might use a spline or whatever, and, and, and interpolate between these things and say, aha, this is my, my model of what f of x should be. Yeah? And this is the reconstruction procedure. And if you think about it, like your computer screen is just a really, really complicated means of doing that. Right? Because your computer screen effectively doesn't make little pinpoints of light. Right? It spreads it out throughout the pixel in some fashion. And effectively what it's doing is, is reconstructing this, this sample signal. Notice that if the computer screen really just gave you back those samples, it would be a pretty crappy computer screen. Because right? you see a bunch of black and little points of light. So it actually is doing some reconstruction there. It would like to blur that signal. Okay, everybody with me so far? Okay, so where do we get in trouble? There, yeah? These are not the same. The purple and the green are not the same function, right? And so mathematicians go to a lot of work to say, under what condition about, like what can we say qualitatively about the purple guy versus the spaces of the red points <coughs> that guarantees that this reconstruction procedure isn't too far off? That makes sense? Yes, yes Justin, that makes sense. We're going to not, because I'm unconfident with this lecture. Okay? Uh, and, and, and notice that, the, in particular, the, the high frequency information here is lost, right? And when I say high frequency, I mean that this wiggled really quickly. Yeah? And that got lost because, and here's the big crowning theorem of Fourier, right? I was able to squeeze a full wiggle between two red guys, and that's the, exactly the signal that gets lost. There's any wiggle that's smaller than the space. Does anybody know what the width of the wiggle is called that's permissible and when you re reconstruct? So this is an N, ends with Iquist. Yes, this is an Iquist ring. Yeah. Okay, so in case uh, this example doesn't have you convinced, um, here's a green function that I sampled very aggressively. Uh, and of course, if I, I reconstructed the purple guy, that's what I would get. 
Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and you guys laugh, but really that's what happens in, in graphics quite a bit. Right? So, so for instance, I was around when they were rendering Finding Nemo. I think I told you guys about this before. Right? And, and, and for some reason, that is like psychologically fascinating to me. Artists really enjoy modeling like aquatic life switching around in the background. But kind of an annoying byproduct of that was that like a single pixel of this movie would have like a whole like three and a half plants sitting underneath it. Right? And so at the end of the day, they had a situation that was a lot like this, right? Like there's like a sea anemone and a fish and I don't know, what, what do you find in the ocean? Sand and a starfish and whatever. And they're all like sitting between two pixels and like at the end of the day, they have to choose like one color. Yeah? And this is a great example where things just go wrong. Yeah? Okay. <laughs> Uh, in fact, if you want the worst possible example, uh, the really famous one that we saw before uh, is this, right? Where if you take a high frequency sine wave and you try to explain it with a low frequency set of samples, uh, you can do it with a perfect fit, yeah? uh, which, is, which is really depressing. So at the end of the day, I think the message you should take out of today's lecture is that if there's too many wavelengths between consecutive samples, you're your host. Yeah? And there's, there's like the most fancy reconstruction algorithm in the world won't be able to help you. You threw that information away. Okay? Um, and we need a way to formalize that. Okay. And, and, and that's where uh, uh, one of our, our favorite uh, mathematicians comes into play. His name is Joseph Fourier. He was around in, what, <coughs> 18th, 19th century? Uh, and I think even if you've seen it in a generic class, maybe you didn't see it explicitly right this way. Right? Essentially, the big point of, of, of Fourier analysis is that I can take most interesting functions, or suspicious values of most, and, and write them as a combination of sines and cosines. Right? And this is, you remember all the way back to like lectures one and two of this class? What did we do? We took like kind of interesting curves, and we wrote them in, as a combination of certain like x, x squared, x cubed, whatever. So here, essentially all Fourier says is rather than using polynomials, you should use trigonometric functions instead. Right? And the great thing about trigonometric functions is they separate frequencies really explicitly. Because right? you can look at the, the, the wiggliness of sine of ax. Right? As a increases, sine of ax becomes more wiggly. And uh, 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 roughly that's less than Fourier functions. Out of function. yeah? curiosity, how many of you guys have computed a Fourier transform at some point in your life? Good, most of you. Then in this case, this is probably a piece really pedantic and exhausting. Okay. Okay. So here's a here's a function f of x. Yeah. And what the Fourier transform does is it, 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 it constructs a new function um, squiggly f of f of uh, 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 xi here. That's a xi. I think it's a xi. Uh, uh, and, and this is supposed to be the frequency content of, 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 of your signal. Right. So the way the way to read this is as I move forward here. These are tensor and denser oscillating functions, right? And, and then roughly the value is saying how much of that oscillating function is hiding inside of this guy. We're going to make this uh, more formal in a second. Okay? And the nice thing about the Fourier transform is it's invertible, uh, meaning that if I give you the frequency, and that's like the big theorem for Fourier, right? If I give you the frequency content of a signal, I can go back to the signal itself. So there's nothing lost. Okay? And, uh, uh, right. So in case you don't have an intuition for what these functions look like, that's great, neither do I. Uh, but let's, let's, let's do some examples. Um, I shamelessly borrowed slides from when I taught graphics at Stanford. Uh, so of course, you're going to see a person who is totally unsympathetic to you guys. Uh, does anybody know who this is? His name is Pat Hamrahan. He's a graphics professor at Stanford. Uh, but he also is the founder of Tableau, which is a company many of you guys have probably heard of. Uh, but at any event, um, here's Pat. And here's Pat's Fourier transform. Right, uh, uh, and, and here the center is the zero frequency mark, and as I move outward, these are higher and higher frequencies. Right, so like for instance, if the frequency content were all out here, which it's not, then Pat would be like black, you know, like grayscale ones. Okay, so let's 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 play with Pat the, with the yikes, Pat's uh, Fourier transform and then invert and see what happens. Okay, uh, so for instance, what happens if I cut out the center? Well, now. Notice that the colors disappeared, and now I'm seeing all this little, these little kind of artifacts. Do you guys see why that would happen? What did I just do by cutting out the center of the Fourier transform? I removed the low frequencies. Yeah? And what are the low frequencies? Well, if I look at the original image, they kind of, I mean, what's moving slowly here is like the color of his face, right? It's pretty constant. 
and so on. And so when I remove that, that low frequency, particularly DC component, um, what I'm left with is just that high frequency stuff, the perturbative uh, stuff on top of the, the blurry part of the panel. In fact, I could do the opposite, right? I could just keep it inside and, and throw away the, the outside. And it's called a low pass filter because it is passing the low frequencies. And now what I get is, is blurry pass. Notice incidentally that the Fourier transform doesn't know anything about sharp edges in images, which is one of many problems uh, in, in practice. Okay, uh, or you can do all kinds of psychedelic stuff. So here's a, a band pass filter where I've said I want neither high nor low frequencies, like stuff in the middle. And you can kind of see that roughly the spacing between these blobs is, is, is probably, has something to do with the distance along this, this axis. So this picture makes some sense to you guys? It's a great way to cook up a midterm question, right? It's give you like, four paths and four Fourier transforms and have you match up to each other. Okay. Um, right, so, so how are we gonna actually compute the Fourier transform? So let's say I have a function f of x, and in addition to that, I have some kind of canonical oscillatory function. So maybe sine of two pi xi of x. And I wanna know how much information these two guys have in common. Okay? So this originally, this, the way I've given it to you here seems kind of abstract, but let's think back to linear algebra class. So what do we do in linear algebra? Like if I have a vector, and I have another vector, and I want to know how close they are to being parallel. What do I do? What's a number that's big when vectors are parallel? Small when they're, you know, metrized. And, and small when they're orthogonal to each other. <coughs> Dot product. Yeah? And I could do something very similar here. For example, I could sample a bunch of x values, right? And I can take f of x at all of those points, and I can take sine of 2 pi xi at all of those points, multiply them together, and sum up, and, and, and have some kind of dot product of these two functions. Yeah? And if I increase the density of those points x more and more and more, uh, you know, so let's say that I have two functions f and g, and one of their dot product. Eventually, what do I do? Well, I take f of x and g of x, but there's a lot of x's, I can't just sum over the slots of the vector. So instead, <coughs> take the, the, the inner product. Does this make sense why this should look like a dot product? Essentially all I did was replace the integral with the sum. Remember that like f as a vector dot g as a vector is like sum f i. Right? But then the similar thing here, like if I sampled a bunch of x's, but now multiply by dx and sum. Everybody see how these are? So, the Fourier transform really is the most brain dead way possible to measure how much frequency content is in a signal, right? Because what it's saying is if I want to know how close f of x is to sine of, of this, like this, this particular sine function, all I'm going to do is multiply and integrate, just like a dot product, right? And that is the, the Fourier transform at a particular value sine. That makes sense? So in particular, um, it, uh, usually we write it in complex numbers, right? Everybody remembers Euler's identity? Right, e to the i pi, pi <laughs> whatever it is, yeah? Um, so when you see uh, this, this slick definition of, of the Fourier transform up top, right? Really all it is is taking dot product between f of x and cosine. Do you see that? But integrating over x. And then essentially mathematicians were, were slick and they said, oh, well, if I want to combine, you know, all of, all, I need both cosine and sine to capture all the frequency component, right? And I'm just going to throw one in the, the real part and one in the complex part, yeah? And even if you don't like thinking about complex numbers, you can think of this as just a slick way to take two dot products at the same time. Okay, so now we all agree that, that the Fourier transform is, is, is brain dead and boring. All it's doing is saying, like, I want to know how much of this cosine is in this function, so I take their dot product. That's it. Cool. And notice this is a function of xi, right? So as I change xi, the integrals over x, which are like those samples, and that changes the width <coughs> of this, this spread gap. Yeah. So at the end of the day, the Fourier transform is, is a pretty uh, uh, geometric uh, object. Everybody with me so far? We're holding on for GLA? Cool. Okay. So that's enough for you. That you've just got an entire you know, like undergrad uh, analysis class in like five minutes or less. So now let's apply it. Uh, so in particular, uh, let's say that I have some function f of x, and I look at Fourier transform. Um, incidentally, I was lazy when I made my slides. So you know what the, the Fourier transform is of a Gaussian 
bell curve. That's another bell curve. And that's like the only thing that goes where you turn from us. There you have it. Um, but now what do I do? Remember, I take F, and I, I, I roll in on the, on the impulse train. And the question is, well, what happens to the Fourier transform of F when I do that? Does anybody know? So I take F and I multiply it by a bunch of little arrows that are just going to sample at a bunch of discrete points, because that's what graphics people do. Notice we're now transitioning from just generic Fourier stuff to, to graphics specific. Something really interesting happens. Yeah. Uh, you get the sync function. No, you, I, I know you know where we're going, but you haven't quite uh, uh, guessed at the right point of lecture, but I'm going to call on you in a minute. Um, so uh, not quite. Actually, what happens is if I sample upstairs, then I take the signal downstairs, and I just repeat it a bunch of times and sum them all together. Anybody know why this happens? Like physically why this happens? If we, if we think of Fourier as frequency content? Let's, let's add a, another clue. So let's say I introduce more samples, then actually the repeats downstairs become farther apart. So there's kind of an inverse relationship happening here. That's kind of a good thing, right? Because if I made an infinite number of samples, I would expect to get the actual Fourier transform back. Um, what's going on here is that one interval between two points fits a lot of different frequencies, and they're indistinguishable. right? So if I want to know all of the curves that begin here and end there and are sine functions, right? I could have one period, I could have two periods, I could have three periods, and so on. And essentially what's going on when, you, when you're mixing frequencies like this is these are all the sort of possible ways that you could observe the signals that you saw upstairs when you sampled. Right? Because it could have been that there was like this very high frequency thing that just wiggled a bunch in between these samples and you didn't see it. Right? And as long as it wiggled in a way that was kind of co-prime with the spacing between your samples, you just wouldn't see it. Does that make sense? So this is a, a phenomenon that people visualize all kinds of different ways. Um, so, so I think the one that we typically see in physics class looks something like this. Right? So I have a piece of string, I, I, I glue it on two sides, and I pluck it. And, and I won't just see this vibration on the top. I'll see all these different vibrations at the same time. This is actually a thing that musicians have known for a long time. Right? And, and they actually leverage it. This is why like, a piano sounds different by it from a violin. Right? Even if they're both playing like the C, right in the middle of the piano. You can hear the difference. Yeah. And in fact, uh, they actually leverage this trick, right? So here's a, a little sound clip, and you guys are going to explain to me what's going on with the violin. Not there, but here. <laughs> Turns out if you're nervous, this trick fails a lot. It's not like a plug and tie and go. Um, Don't you got like stationary point? Yeah, so let's take a look back at this diagram again. So what happens if I put my finger very gently right at this point? Can the string vibrate like this anymore? No. Can it vibrate like that anymore? No, but it can vibrate like this and this. Yeah? So in effect, I just turned off certain frequencies and kept other ones on. And that's essentially all that's going on in this, in this violin playing trick, is you're just filtering the frequencies that come out of your instrument. Yeah? We're going to do a very similar thing in graphics, but we're going to do the opposite, right? Because we want to kill the high frequencies and keep the low frequency information. Right? We're going to do an inverse uh, violin, whatever that means. There actually is a name for that trick, by the way. It's like if you push too hard with your bow on your string, you can get a lower pitch than, than the lowest pitch on your instrument. Um, I, I forget what it's called. Anyway, it shows up all over music. Uh, but it also shows up uh, in graphics, but in the opposite way, right? Which is, in this case, we have these spurious low frequencies that are getting confused because we don't understand. Okay. So, right. If we, if we look back at our theoretical picture, what, what happened here? Well, in effect, we took our original Fourier transform, this purple guy, and we <coughs> repeated it a bunch of times and sent them all together, and then we're just unable to recover the original Fourier transform because they all mixed together. Do you see that? Because, like, the tail of this one got mixed with the tail of this guy. But at the end of the day, you don't see these two functions. You just see one with a bunch of bumps. Right? 
right? And that's what's going on. That's why you're seeing all these crazy mixed together frequencies. So as mathematicians, what do we often do? We look at a problem and we say, okay, well, I can't solve this in general, but let's find a case where we can. Yeah? In particular, let's say that my Fourier transform repeated every, you know, 10 hertz, right? Like, that's the, when, I, when I sampled, I sampled in such a way that it repeats every 10 hertz. But let's say that all of the frequencies in my signal were between 0 and 2 hertz, okay? So my picture looks something like this. I have, here's the xi. Okay. Here's my uh, here's my, my my Fourier transform, and it's a very low frequency function. It just has a little bump like that, yeah. And then I sampled it extremely densely, which means that I took this bump, and I do get to know the, the rate of my sampling value. I do get to know the spacing between these things. Well, if I wanted to recover the original signal, in this case, I would be okay, right? I could take this function, I could multiply it by something that is zero outside of that box. And, right, in Fourier space, and then I could just apply Fourier transform to it again, put it back in, in, in spatial area, and now I have the original signal back. So that's a, that's a kind of an interesting observation, right? When, when is this not a problem? Is when essentially my function is everywhere else zero. In other words, there's no high frequency information, right? Then when I sample it, Right, this is called the bandwidth, by the way. This is the width of this thing. These are probably terms you've heard before. Yeah? When I sample it, it repeats like that, but there's no interference anymore. Cool? Does anybody know? So remember that as I increase the density of my sampling, the spacing between these purple guys gets larger. Right? So for a given signal, which is band limited, in other words, it does not contain frequencies out of some band, right? there's some spacing of samples where if I make things more dense, it's, just, it's not going to matter anymore, right? It's just going to move these things farther and farther apart. They don't touch anything. And that sampling is called the Nyquist rate. Okay? And what the Nyquist rate is, is given a signal, that is the spacing that you need to be able to resolve that signal in the Fourier domain. Right? So, so roughly, what's the Nyquist rate saying? It's saying that the more wiggly your signal is, the more samples you have. Yeah? Uh, if, if, if you feel fancy, you can say it's two times the bandwidth of the band-limited signal. That makes sense because if you kind of think of the bandwidth as the, the, this distance here, then you multiply it by two and that's the space. <coughs> yeah. uh, and so what could you do? Well, if you're given that guy with a bunch of repeats and you knew the space between the repeats, you could just window out all that other information and then take the Fourier transform and get the original function back. Obviously, you can't actually do that. We don't have access to Fourier transforms. Right? But in, in the concept, this is what we might do. So in other words, I might take this function and multiply it by a function which is 1 in the inside of my band and 0 everywhere else. This is called the box function. That makes sense? So the box uh, function is a pretty simple one. Right? It looks something like, you know, box 1, if t. Right. So let's say that, that, that Larry and Sophie continue playing their game, and Larry does sample the Nyquist rate, and he hands Sophie a list of all of his samples, and he tells her the spacing between them. That part is key. You don't have that here in trouble. Right? Now what can Sophie do? She can take the Fourier transform of Larry's sampled data. That she has access to. Right? And she can edit it any way she wants. So she's going to just turn off the high frequencies in that Fourier transform and just have this thing back. And then Fourier transform it again, and what she gets is the original signal back. And everybody's happy. Yeah? And this is a nice, idealized story. What goes wrong? Do there exist band limited signals in the real world? No. Does anybody know another name for this principle? It's a very famous one in physics. This is the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Yeah? And for exactly the same reason. You can't have a compactly supported Fourier domain and a compactly supported spatial domain. You've got to choose one or the other. Right? So necessarily, if I have a compactly supported Fourier thing, it means I can't draw an image on it. So, so the, uh, but in any event, we can have really smooth things where essentially there's, there's a pretty small tail out here. 
So the last missing piece of the puzzle here, you know, Larry hands over to Sophie these samples. She takes a Fourier transform. She messes with it. Now she's going to transform it back. Um, but that's an awfully complicated algorithm for her. Uh, so instead, we might, or for anybody, sorry. Uh, <laughs> and the, uh, sorry, Sophie's a very capable TA, but she doesn't have uh, access to an infinite amount of computing capacity, which is what we would need. Uh, and, and so instead, um, what she'd like to do is edit the signal in the spatial domain in a fashion that is equivalent to multiplying by a box in the <coughs> spectral domain. So there's, a, there's some math joke that I forget where the punchline is that they're in the spectral domain and lots of ghosts, and it's Halloween and they're meant to look at it before class. <laughs> okay, uh, right. But, but <laughs> in any event, um, essentially, uh, one thing that you can show is that if you multiply in the Fourier domain, then that's the same thing as convolving in the spatial domain. Um, and so essentially, uh, when, you, when you multiply the rect with, with the Fourier transform of your sample function in Fourier land, that's the same thing as convolving the Fourier transform of your function with the Fourier transform of this rectangle function uh, in space. This is called the convolution theorem. And it kind of makes sense, because if you remember what convolution is doing, it's kind of like, if you, 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 if you have f star g, oops, that's supposed to be star, so I have two functions and I want to convolve them. Then what I do is uh, we have f of x, g of t minus x, g x. Something like that. I always get the signs back where it doesn't really matter. Yeah? But one way to think about it is that essentially you can think of, of, of g as being shifted by t. Right? That's what this constant is doing here. And so the, the value of the convolution here is kind of like saying, so if this is, uh, I don't know, what is f? Uh, maybe f is some function like that. And then g is like a box. Right? Then if I convolve the two, it's kind of like saying, well, I'm going to move the box here and then integrate those two against each other. And that's going to be the output at this, this value. That's kind of like blurring stuff out. I warned you this is going to be extremely fuzzy like this. Uh, but in, in any event, um, this kind of makes sense because what, what is the solution to uh, 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 killing high frequencies in the spectral domain? It's kind of like blurring out your data in the spatial domain. And that's exactly what's going on here. So the one remaining piece is what do you convolve against? If you multiply in Fourier uh, land by the box function, then in spatial land you've got to convolve with the Fourier transform of the box. And what is the Fourier transform of the box? The sink function. Thank you. Uh, somebody gave the punchline, but forgot the story. Uh, and, and, and here it is. Uh, it's this crazy function here. It looks roughly like cosine of x divided by x. And so at the end of the day, um, our, our beautiful picture looks something like this. Here's our, our perfect marriage between spectral and spatial worlds. The spectral domain, the spectral, this is going to kill me. What is this doing? <sighs> okay, so I have, I have some function, and he has some band-limited Fourier transform, meaning that he's a pretty low frequency smooth operator. Okay, what do I do? I sample him above the Nyquist rate, and that, in the frequency domain, right, it's kind of like the violin of all high pitches, introduces all of these, this high pitch information, because I don't know if secretly hiding between these two things is a, a, some high frequency in the build. Right? This is all Larry's side of the story, and then Larry gives to Sophie this long list of red numbers, and Sophie, being the extremely com capable computer scientist that she is, takes this thing and says, I would like to reconstruct it. And the way that I reconstruct it is in the frequency domain by just multiplying by this box function, which is equivalent in the spatial domain to convolving with the sync function. Or in other words, taking a bunch of copies of sync scaled by this vertical value and summing them up like that. And the beautiful thing here is that if my original signal was band limited, I actually didn't make any approximation in doing it. This was an exact procedure. Yeah? And that is our nice, beautiful story, uh, this, 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 this marriage here. It says, as long as the spacing between these red guys is such that I have that little amount of zero space that I can zero out, I'm good. But if these things are too far apart, then these guys begin to overlap, and the information <coughs> gets lost. Frequencies get mixed. So here's the only problem, uh, is that this whole story is totally useless for a bunch of different reasons. Uh, and this is where theory meets reality.
great. Of course, uh, practical signals never have finite bandwidth. This is exactly the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, the graphics version. If you Google it, <coughs> you'll, you'll be able to understand. Um, but there's actually a bunch more practical issues that, that, that make this uh, a, a, a very problematic. Um, so one is that essentially what we showed is that the ideal reconstruction filter is the sync function, the Fourier transformable box. Here's the thing. Let's say that I wanted to make a computer display. Right? And so essentially what, I, what I've argued to you guys is that every pixel of my computer display should really output a distribution of light that looks like this. Right? And if I do that, then as long as I'm displaying low frequency photographs, then, then life is good. This is a problem, right? Because I can't have a computer screen that sucks in light. Yeah? So this negative load here, from a practical perspective, is, is useless. Yeah? And so what people typically do in practice instead uh, is to use some pro uh, kind of positive approximation. Um, but even if they do that, they get in trouble uh, because the sync function, right? If it looks like cosine of x over x, what is the what is the support of that function? Like, how many x's do I need? A lot. It's got infinite support. Right? It kind of has to, but it has a high degree of certainty. Yeah. Uh, so here's sync. Right? The further I go to an x, it, can, it it decays. But no matter how far I get, it's, it's actually kind of an interesting thing that you learn here, right? Which is that to perfectly reconstruct a single signal, I actually need information from far away. This is kind of surprising. But from a graphics algorithm perspective, is this so good? Right? To reconstruct a sample algorithm to give one uh, image, to get a value of one pixel out of look over the whole photograph, right? Which wouldn't be terribly efficient. Yeah. And uh, it turns out you really shouldn't be taking Fourier transforms of, of images anyway, uh, because of, of, of things like sharp edges, which can, can get you in trouble, right? And a sharp edge is this extremely high frequency artifact that you just can't get rid of. And so, so really, to do this correctly, you, you need to, to deal with the frequencies in, in, in a kind of nice, careful way. So anyway, that ends our, our math for, for the day. Uh, we're not going to class, okay. uh, But hopefully now you guys get some idea of the flavor of the kinds of arguments that people make, right? Now roughly, what's going on here is that when I sample at the Nyquist rate, what I'm doing is trying to counteract the, 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 the copying of the frequency content by making them far enough apart that it's easy for me to window it out later. That's all that's going on. Yeah. Uh, and, and, and roughly, the, the, the take home message is just you need to sample at two times the spacing between any interesting thing. Which you kind of could have guessed anyway. <laughs> but that's okay. All right. Then let's talk about practice. And this is where things are intuitive and that's what it's fast to think about. Um, so in practice, uh, how do we counteract the jaggies? Well, typically we super sample, meaning that we just draw a bunch of, of, of rays per pixel and average the color together. <laughs> but now, what do you think? How should we average them together? We should use the sync function, right? Meaning that to get the color at a particular pixel, what I should do is actually draw samples from rays that are distributed in a big neighborhood of the pixel, not even just in that little square. Uh, and then weight them by value of sync and take the weighted average. And that's a, roughly sort of the morally correct uh, thing to do. What's the problem with this strategy? What piece of information did I say that Larry had to communicate in addition to the set of samples? You have to know the right frequency. Right? Do we know the frequency content of, like, I don't know, the city of Boston as I look out of the window of the classroom? No. Right? Uh, so the best we can do is guess and, and choose a magic number that makes our image look good. Yeah. Um, but in any event, um, uh, that's one thing people do. Um, right. And there are a lot of different super sampling strategies out there. The simplest one is uniform super sampling. This is my favorite because I'm lazy. But what I need to do is just compute an image that's k times as big and then just kind of downsample it. There are many different ways to do that. Right? You could use kind of Gaussian weights that decay from the center. You could just average in a square. What have you? Um, the typical visualization of, of what this looks like looks something like uh, this, which is, let's say that I have that really dense big image that I just computed, and now I'm gonna, but that thing is aliased, and now I'm gonna make a smaller but anti-alias image, right? Then typically you'll see people write down these little squares, which are like the weights of relative pixels as you move away from the center, right? So this is saying that 41 270 thirds of my output pixel come from this, this input pixel on the larger scale image. Does this, does this make sense? So this is like a convolution filter. I guess these days I should describe it as like a layer of your deep network, right? Um, so these would be the, uh, the weights of the convolution filter and then you would have a stride that shrinks it. 
it's weird to explain it that way, because typically you learn this first, but I don't think that's true anymore. Uh, but in any event, I think you guys get the idea, which is that the output value in a pixel is some weighted average of stuff that's nearby. And typically those weights kind of decay from the center. In reality, this should be sync, but then you run the risk of having a negative number, and, and, and that's so it's such a bad risk that typically people don't want to um, There's really nice pictures of what this looks like. Right here's another one where they kind of slide this cone weighting function over the image. Um, and essentially, this is just some way to make a uh, blurred out thing so that no pixel has that sharp artifact. Uh, of course, uh, uh, there are many ways to construct that filter. This, by the way, seems like a subtle point, but it really isn't. Uh, and, and we'll see some examples in a second. Uh, one, of the, one thing that people typically do is use a bicubic, hopefully you all know what that means by now, uh, approximation of sync, which is just sync with one little itty bitty negative lobe. And that usually is, is good enough to be a good approximation, but still avoid like, negative numbers when you round and do crazy stuff. Yeah. Um, so here's some examples. So here's a, 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 our favorite, you know, two balls with a, a checkerboard scene. Uh, and this thing is, is, is uh, anti-aliased using the box filter. You can still see some uh, moray style artifacts, right? You can see right here there's some low frequency artifact that shouldn't be there. I could you guys sit down with the slides and look closer than I can. Uh, okay, uh, but if I, if I use that bicubic approximation, look closely in the background, and toggle between them, what happened? Yeah, that weird low frequency content, which is actually going this way, went away. Yeah, uh, and that's because well, the theory and practice agreed, right? And roughly, um, you, you, you can, you know, at this point, you're sampling below the Nyquist rate because these cubes got too close together, um, but you use the right filter to kind of at least blur that information. Cool. Um, right. So uh, that's a, that's a pretty standard technique. Uh, uh, and, and this is called uniform super sampling. The idea is you just make an image that's like three times as big and then shrink it with a particular set of averaging weights when you shrink. That makes sense. So the advantage here is that often this is like kind of the easiest thing to implement. Essentially, you're just doing you know non-anti-alias rendering on a bigger grid and then doing a separate pass where you shrink everything. <laughs> but what can go wrong? Well, in particular, if you have a repetitive texture, right? And that texture itself happens to be kind of aligned with the grid of that bigger image, then you can still get in trouble this way. Uh, so a good example, um, which I, I think we sketched out a few months ago, is like, I, I'm rendering a checkerboard, and uh, you know, my super sampled image, uh, even number, is like that. And for whatever reason, my checkerboard is like one every four pixels. And I shrink by a factor of two, I could run in tr into trouble because now in my shrunk by a factor of two, well, this thing still thinks that it's all one big solid color, right? I haven't gotten anything any blurrier, right? And so, and so this could be a little uh, problematic. So typically what people do is jigger their samples a little bit rather than saying I do it uniformly on a big grid and then shrink it, just like everything a little bit random, right? yep. Um, so a different way of understanding that is roughly super sampling does help, right? It pushes your problem farther away, but you still have an Nyquist rate of that super sampled image that you have to cope with, right? So there could still be aliasing that you didn't place. So here's a, a big theme in graphics, which is that your eyes are really good at ignoring noise, right? What you would prefer is just white noise to a moray pattern. Remember your moray patterns, that low frequency that you saw? And, and, and uniform super sampling is often subject to moray patterns because essentially you just created an image two times as big, but it still has aliasing issues. And so often what we'll do is in that image that's two times as big, we're going to make the color at that pixel actually the color a slightly perturbed location each time. And that just basically increases noise in your image. It doesn't necessarily increase the frequency, like in a very mathematical perspective, it's not like you made this better or worse uh, from approximation, but from a, like from a perceptual standpoint, you're, you're much better at ignoring noise than you are at like some weird spurious low frequency, right? And this idea is called uh, jittering. The idea that rather than putting my pixel centers and the plus signs on a grid, I'm going to take each one and just randomly perturb it a little bit. Um, because we don't really know where the center of the pixel is anyway, right? So we might as well sample from a slightly different place just so that in case my data happens to be on a grid, I don't align to it and get this crazy artifact. Does that make sense? Uh, and, and, and so that's the, the usual trick. So here's, um, Jittered super sampling um, with 
uh, more and more jittering, meaning more and more spacing from the center of the pixel. These images are a little hard to see, but already you can actually see. Uh, <coughs> here, this is not anti-aliased in the conventional sense at all, meaning that there's one ray per pixel here. It's just that the position of that ray is slightly kind of messed up at every pixel. Right? And now I think this uh, pretty clearly illustrates why this is a useful technique, right? Because here, what do you see? You see a moiré pattern, like in the upper left corner. There's actually coherent areas of color that shouldn't be there. But here, because if I like jittered that pixel slightly, the color would change. What do I get instead? I don't get something attractive. I just get red-green noise. But from where you guys are sitting, I think you're much more inclined to ignore that noise than you are that like weird frequency in the corner. Right? That's the, the philosophy behind jitter. And obviously these techniques can be combined, right? I can have multiple jittered samples per pixel, uh, and, and here's uh, an example of that, and, and pretty quickly the camera just suggests blurry stuff, which is really what you want. Uh, okay, so there's all kinds of crazy issues that, that show up in, in, this, uh, in this literature, and this has really been a focus for computer graphics since its inception, is how do you deal with uh, aliasing artifacts, and there's no right answer, there's a lot of techniques out there. Um, one issue that, that shows up a lot is texture maps, Right, so remember we talked about mip mapping, this idea being that a different way of convolving against that filter would be before I even go about rendering my texture shape to just shrink the texture itself so that one pixel of my shrunken texture is actually a bunch of pixels in the original guy. But how did I shrink it? I shrunk it in image space. You see that? In effect, I drew concentric circles in image space as I generated that mip map. But then when I render my shape, maybe I tilt it away from the camera, so instead of getting circles, now I have ellipses in texture space. And I can't compute a, a mid-map for every possible ellipse. That's too big. Yeah? So this is one of these totally crazy, irritating issues that shows up in graphics and it's really, really hard to cope with. This is less of a problem, incidentally, in ray tracing, where like if you just generate a bunch of rays, you can average them together. Um, but, but when we talk about rasterization, this will become really problematic. This idea that if I draw a square in the image plate, but the plane that I'm taking a photograph points away from the camera, that actually makes an ellipse out of well, If I draw a circle in the image plane, it makes an ellipse. Uh, does that issue make sense to everybody? Right. Um, so, so, right. So, so, essentially, the high level issue here is that when you're doing texture mapping, it's very rare that the screen space sampling density and the image space density are the same. Okay? And, and so, what can we do? Well, magnifying is not so bad, right? You can just Literally interpolate, use a box, sync, whatever fills you want, and, and do okay. Um, the issue is more uh, the minification uh, structure, I think we already talked this. But essentially, uh, the irritating test case, and the one that you see video games really fail at, by the way, uh, is, is, is looking at brick walls from the bottom. <laughs> yeah? Tall buildings are really problematic in, 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 in for, for anti aliasing purpose. Yeah? And so, um, Let me do my slides are more repetitive. Yeah, so even with just a simple mip mapping, uh, you, you can see already you do a lot better. Uh, but finding that mip level is actually difficult because if I look at the square of the pixel, the mip level for the front of the pixel and for the back of the pixel might not be the same. Yeah? Uh, and, and, and so oftentimes what people will do, uh, which is pretty crazy, is, is, is start taking the gradient of the image and saying like, well, if I take a unit space here, how far does the coordinate move in the two directions here? That defines some ellipse in the image plane. You see that? So like if I go up one unit, then this pixel went so far. If I went to the right one unit, it went less far. So now I have some rough region that I'd like to integrate over the image plane. And now you have to cope with that some. Yeah? Like here's a great example of what goes wrong. <laughs> um, so here's uh, uh, some, some bitmapped uh, 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 lines, and you can see that because they're kind of converging in a diagonal fashion, you, you, you lose the, the position of the line. Yeah. Instead, uh, what you want to do is take an elliptical weighted average. Um, the only problem is that you can't. <laughs> right? the, the, this is an extremely tricky thing to do. So oftentimes what we'll do is say, instead of an ellipse, I'm going to replace this guy with the sum of a few circles, right? like a big circle in the middle and then a few going out. And those I read out of my like, in that. Uh, so this is this idea that roughly a, a, a function that looks like this could be approximated with a sum of like something, you know, a bunch of circles with different weights. So I read off one bitmap value for each of these circles and then I average them together. Yeah, kind of sneaky. 
Okay, so, uh, right, there's all kinds of uh, beautiful images of what this looks like. Um, so here, this is with the elliptical weighted average. So in the, in the checkerboard plane, this is kind of taking averages that go in this direction. The way that it does that is by replacing the lips with a bunch of circles that kind of approximate it. You guys could engineer that pretty easily, right? You compute the axis of the ellipse and then place circles with radii that kind of look like the width of the ellipse in the other direction. Uh, and what you can get out is, is take a look at these beautiful lines that go straight back in the checkerboard plane uh, versus uh, over here where we just use the kind of square thing because you still frustratingly get more air effects because your filters aren't aligned to the texture. But anyway, this is just a detail on something I've had to mention. So anyway, uh, as one last detail, where do you guys think that anti-aliasing matters the most in the graphics pipeline? What graphics application really cares about anti-aliasing? Any ideas? Text. Text, exactly. This is surprising, right? We usually think about rendering, you know, like 3D graphics or <coughs> crazy stuff as somehow the most challenging task, but actually that is not true. For anti-aliasing, the problem is rendering fonts. And why is that? Well, most of you guys who aren't paying attention in class are looking at fonts on your computer screen. Yeah? And they're really darn small. <laughs> yeah? And so every letter that you type in Times New Roman or, or Courier or whatever that LaTeX font is, uh, it really takes up a very small little patch of pixels, but yet yeah, it's supposed to communicate a pretty high frequency object, right? Fonts have ligatures and all these little lines and so on. Yeah? And so most of the motivating thought to anti-aliasing for your everyday life has gone into fonts, also because you have to render a ton of letters on your computer screen. Yeah? Uh, and so one of the really clever tricks that, that, that was introduced um, uh, not so long ago is something called clear type. Do you, have you guys ever seen this on your computer? So the idea of clear type uh, is, is illustrated here. So everything we've talked about today, uh, we, we've talked about on sort of a pixel grid. But the reality of your, your computer screen, this is more true for CRT, but it's also true for, for laptop, uh, is that you don't just get like an RGB color per square on your screen, right? The reality is that you have a backlight on your computer screen, and then there's a grid of RGB, 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 and they're so dense on your computer <laughs> screen that you perceive color as the combination of these things, as I'm doing right now. Uh, and, 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 and so, you know, if you get all up into your, your laptop's business here, you'll see that there, there's just any bit of little points of individual colors going on. Yeah? And so the really clever patented technology, I believe, uh, of, of clear type was to actually expose the structure of your computer monitor to the operating system. And the reason was you could get three times better necklace weight for your, for your funds. Right? And, 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 and that's actually shown in the, in the right uh, column here. Right? So if I represent data the way that we talked about in class today, right, essentially I would have to turn on and off all three RGB colors at once. But the idea of clear type for font rendering was that, in fact, you can get sub-pixel accuracy by anti-aliasing <coughs> red, green, and blue channels independently. Yeah? Uh, and in fact, this makes one of the biggest difference um, in, in your computer screen. It was really a huge jump forward. Probably you guys are too young to remember the old CRT screens when this didn't exist, but it really hurt your eyes. <laughs> and uh, yeah, unfortunately, implementing clear type is extremely difficult to do because I mean, think about all the information that I need to be able to implement that. Right? I need to know the structure of the subpixels on your computer screen. Right? And so this is a great example of standardization. Right? As long as we all agree on how we're going to make computer monitors, we can all agree on nice clear type fonts that, that, that work out together. Um, of course, these days there's this huge variety of displays, um, but thankfully we're overcoming this problem in a different fashion, which is that we just have really good screens and it doesn't matter. Yeah? Um, but anyway, if you're curious, this is, this is the idea behind the clear type uh, font technology. It's just that you can actually do better anti-aliasing your pixel grid might suggest. All right, so any questions about uh, anti-aliasing, how we do it in practice or in theory? Yeah, hopefully you guys get the basic idea here, right? Which is that you better sample densely, or else you're going to be in trouble and you can't reconstruct. <laughs> yeah, so this is all kind of second order. Yeah? And if you're looking for a really easy extension, your ray tracer assignment, that you can easily do it in the next 24 hours. It is uh, sub-pixel uh, uh, anti-aliasing, right? It just means scatter a bunch of rays into your pixel and take damage. Yeah. All right, guys, so with that, we'll, we'll call it for the day. I will see you on, what's today? Is today Tuesday? This Tuesday. I'll see you on Thursday. Your homework is due on Thursday, so don't forget that. Uh, come to my office hours, I get lonely. Uh,